Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Meher, and I'm very excited to welcome you on the behalf of Radix Media for the book launch of Bint by Ginwa Johari. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly describe the frame. I am an Indian woman with black hair, and I have some makeup on, and I've got a cool. paper on, and I'm wearing a very 80s striped shirt. Uh, there are multiple green and orange stripes on it. And behind me, there is a very boring wall archway. Uh, so to begin, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, at Radix Media. We're very excited to be publishing Ginwa Johari's debut. Uh, Bint is an exceptional co small collection of poems that is committed to telling, uh, to, that is committed to uncovering the stories and secrets and experiences of girlhood. Um, and we are so excited to be uh, the publishers behind it. Um, so uh, Bint happened last year to us. As some of you may know, uh, last year we uh, had the debut Own Voices Prize. And for the first iteration of the prize, we decided to accept chapbook submissions from Poets of Color. Um, the Own Voices Prize was an initiative from us for to able to able uh, so that we could be able to identify emerging writers of color, writers who hadn't yet published a full length book, writers who were waiting with collection on hand, uh, who were waiting to be published. Uh, we were honored and thrilled that Arya Eber, who is a reader today, joined us as the guest judge for the first iteration of the prize. And Arya picked uh, Bint by Ginwa and they're still singing in the afterlife by Jin Jin, which we released in November um, 2020 uh, last year as the winning manuscripts of the first iteration of the prize. Uh, we will be announcing uh, the 2021 iteration of the prize in a couple of months. Uh, it won't be for chapbooks this time. So that will be the little clue that I can give you. We will be changing the genre, switching it up every year. So keep an eye out for that if you are a writer of color with a book on hand. Uh, if you need to know, if you want to know more more about Radix Media and what we do. Uh, as some of you know, we are a worker owned, completely unionized print shop, as well as an independent publisher. We take our uh, values very seriously. We are very political. Uh, we back work uh, from the margins by marginalized writers. We're committed to elevating voices that are not often represented in mainstream publishing. Uh, and we love political works. So if you consider yourself a writer whose politics are very much in tune with their literature, please get in touch with us. That is our website. There is a print section and there is a publishing section so you can go to whichever one suits your needs. Um, I'm very excited for today's event. We have a great lineup of readers. We have the lovely Arya Aber, who was the judge for the Own Voices Prize. We have Lela Chatti. We have George Abraham. We have Hala Alian uh, featuring in a very special video appearance. Uh, Hala couldn't be here because of an uh, urgent family emergency, but she very kindly sent us a video. And then we have the poet of the hour, Ginwa Johari. Um, so we're going to begin in a couple of minutes. Uh, if you guys have any comments or questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, one of the things, uh, you know, because I guess Zoom can be a bit isolating. Uh, it's not like a reading in real time, in person. We all miss that. It used to happen in pre-pandemic world. What even was that life, right? I mean, it's been a minute. But uh, one of the things to be able to, uh, to, to make sure that this space can be as engaging as real life can be, one of the things I ask audience members to do is that anytime you like a line, feel free to talk about it in the chat to make sure, make your chat, uh, you know, the virtual equivalent of a bar where you're sort of collected after reading and you're talking about how good was that? How good was she? Should I go talk to her? You know, that version, but make that, make chat the virtual version of that real life, uh, you know, uh, fan moment. Uh, you can talk about the lines you like. I usually, <laughs> I usually like, one of the things I like to do as an audience member is just rewrite the line that I really loved and put a fire emoji. I feel like that does everything. I feel like it, it, that's, that's the perfect encapsulation. Uh, feel free to 
communicate, talk to each other, post songs that a poem reminds you of, you know, whatever you want to do, make the chat your home. Uh, if you'd like to, at the end of a reading, if you'd like to unmute yourself for a quick snap or a quick clap, uh, you're welcome to do that. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We're very excited to have you here. So our first reader for the day is Lela Chatti. I'm going to share their bio in the chat window really quickly. Lela Chatti is a Tunisian American poet and author of Deluge from Copper Canyon Press 2020 and the chapbooks Ebb from Akashic Books 2018 and Tunzia Amrikia, the 2017 editor selection from Bull City Press. Her honors include a Pushcart Prize, grants from the NEA, the Barbara Deming Memorial Fund and the Helen Berlitzer Foundation and fellowships from the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing and Cleveland State University where she was the inaugural Anisfield Wolf Fellow in Publishing and Writing. She currently teaches at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she is the Mendota Lecturer in Poetry. Her poems appear in the New York Times Magazine, Poetry, Plus Shares, Tin House, American Poetry Review, and elsewhere. Welcome, Leila. The mic is yours. Thank you. And what an honor to be here. I'm really excited. When I saw this lineup, I was <laughs> very selfishly excited to hear what everyone else is going to read. So I'll just kind of get out of the way. You know, I want to say just a giant congratulations. I'm so excited for you and I'm so excited for your book. Um, so thank you for having me in the celebration. Um, I get very anxious, so I prefer to just kind of read straight through. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. And I tried to think of poems. Um, a lot of my book is also trying to talk about girlhood and womanhood. Um, so I was trying to pick some poems that do that. I'm gonna start with the first, um, which is called Confession. Um, and it begins with an epigraph from Mary when she's giving birth to Jesus in the throne. And she says, oh, I wish I had died before this and was in oblivion, forgotten. Truth be told, I like Mary a little better when I imagine her like this, crouched and cursing, a boy God pushing on her cervix. I like remembering she had a cervix, her body ordinary, and so like mine. Girl sweat lacing rivulets like veins in the sand. Her small hands on her knees, not doves, but hands gripping, a palm pressed to her spine, fronds whispering like voyeurs overhead. Oh, Mary, like a god, I too take pleasure in knowing you are not all holy. That ache could undo you like a knot. And suffering, I admire this girl who cared for a moment not about God or his plans, but her own distinct life. This fiercer Mary who'd disappear if it saved her, who'd howl to hell with salvation if it meant this pain. The blessed adolescent who squatted indignant in a desert, bearing his child like a secret she never wanted to hear. Mary speaks. And what could I say when he entered? Rude as a dream, fair flame of a man with wings and demands, not his own. I'd been raised a good girl to house my tongue in my mouth, to be hospitable towards strangers, suspicious of no one. Perhaps I'd have been better off to be wary, but I'd been waiting so long to hear God speak. I hadn't thought to think of what he might tell me. Mother, if you had asked me 13 what I wanted to be one day, I wouldn't have said it. I wanted for a long time to be anything but myself, knew that a soon-to-be woman was the second worst thing in the world after a woman full stop and I was heading there fast. I could see it, my breasts rudely nudging into view, their snug caps like the knit caps of infants, rosy colored as a tongue. And how terrifying, the thought of a mouth there, rooting and what could be drawn from me that I didn't need. What else sculpted in me unseen, stirring in secret vats with milk yet untapped and blood, the strange new wellspring. 
I was just beginning to understand the possibilities. My body's elusive, independent workings, machineries chugging away in dark chambers, not just left to, but simply their own devices, unknowable and sovereign. What I wanted always to be in control. And I knew this was impossible. Just as I knew, even then, that to be a mother was to be the only permissible form of a woman, the begrudging exception to the rule of our worthlessness. So if you ask me again, 23, I tell you the worst thing you could be is not a woman, but barren, the industry shut down and the parts missing, malformed. And I tell you the shame of it, the feminine failure, its ache, a reminder, at the center, the tumor, ballooning, my cope. Um, and this one is called Heimer Hoyce's Menar. She's the woman with the issue of blood in the Bible. Um, okay. I wanted to be a woman until I was. What opened in me brought such pain, I believed finally one day I would die. But it subsided for a while. I remember thinking I was cured, I could go back to being a child. Then the next lump, red seed in the morning's bowl, unfurling as it touched the water. Hyman, second blood, I never knew you. After the first, scoured the bed for your blazoned blot and came up empty. Perhaps I was born without you. A box with no prize inside, a Sunday with no cherry on top. God of good girls, God of matrimony, mother state, which I consider a distant country with a discordant tongue. Did you speak with God and conclude I had an use for you? Once I was small as your kin, so small and for such a long time, longer than I've lived, I fit inside my mother when she fit inside her mother, and so on and so forth, and further, a nest of matrons, knees and a beam, in which to be female is to be something like infinity, and was it determined then what kind of woman I would be? It seems I've always been frightened, little veil of wedlocks lock, clicking shut, the heritable procession of women whispering in the aisle of my pulse, don't do, don't do, don't. And I haven't done. This, the grave of men, the grave I've dug with the spade of pleasure. But wanting seal of want, I did want it did choose to commit my life's greatest transgression with the benevolent accomplice. And so in the here before, you could say I am among the spared. What a mess this messlessness of you could have been in any number of lives my size, billowing specters of dresses and a line of possibility, lives in which I am the bridesmaid and you maidenhead, the bride given away, where I am the acquired property and you the red ribbon severed in the threshold, I the purse and you the coin tendered. Perhaps no one ever told you, precious emblem of innocence, simulacrum for honor, that some believe you the most important part of me, vital, like a heart a man gets a thrill of bursting where he can see it, that blood is owed to him. And that's the heart of it, isn't it? Of a woman, you, the only blood worth anything. And I'm going to end on... Um, a poem of questions. Before they do that, I realized that I didn't um, describe myself. So I'm a Tunisian woman, light skin, hair in a braid, um, wearing a white blouse with black polka dots and a yellow cardigan. And I have a ficus behind me. Okay. This poem's called Questions Directed Toward the Idea of Mary. Was it the voice you feared or its shadow? 
Did you long for his touch or was suffering enough for you to know he was there? Do you resent me, my juvenile hungers? Do you wish for me the freedom of a vast urine plain? What would you have done with your body if your body obliged? Did it please you, your son risen at the end like a question? Do you pity the angels, their ancillary lives? Did your worship falter once you were sure you were good? How long did you live before yielding to your inevitable shame? And how long before you realized? Did you realize? Shame was a blade you turned against yourself. And once you knew it, you could use it. Thank you. Wow, snaps, snaps all around. Uh, Lala, I'm gonna shamelessly plug the Bollywood song I was telling you about uh, that is hopelessly in love with someone called Lela, and that is how I feel uh, after this song because I am just, I've been obsessed with that song and I think I'm gonna be obsessed with this reading for some time now. Thank you for that beautiful performance. Like a lot of people rightly mentioned, your voice is so soothing and then you come across these lines that are so incisive and honest and brilliant. And so the combination, uh, I mean, I'm in awe. Thank you for that performance. Um, I'm very excited to welcome our next poet for the evening, who is one of my most favorite uh, contemporary poets in the game. Uh, the game sounds a little crass, but I think if you're inside the game, it's okay to call it a game, I think. Uh, but George Abraham is one of my most favorite poets. Their book, Birthright, was hands down my top five favorite collections of last year. And so just to be able to have jo uh, George's friendship and George's companionship in the poetry world, uh, as some of you who may know George would know, George is incredibly kind and incredibly, like very good at hyping uh, you. And so I'm so glad uh, that they're here to celebrate Ginwa's Bint. So I'm gonna quickly introduce George to all of you. George Abraham, they, he, is a Palestinian American poet from Jacksonville, Florida. They're the author of Birth, Birthright, Button Poetry 2020, a board member for the Radius of Arab American Writers, RAWI, and a recipient of fellowships from Kundiman and the Boston Foundation. His work has appeared in the American Poetry Review, the Baffler, the Paris Review, Mesna, and elsewhere. A graduate of Swarthmore College and Harvard University, Abraham is currently based in Somerville, Massachusetts and teaches at Emerson College. It is my absolute honor to welcome George to the mic. Thank you. Thank you, Meher. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I, I love, um, I love and hate the challenge of following after Layla. Um, because um, anyone who has to follow Layla is like, how the fuck do you do that? Um, thank you, Layla. I'm so glad to be in space with you, Aria and Hella virtually and the star of the night, Inwa, who, uh, I came across in, um, I first like really like came across her work as uh, one of the readers for Mizna Queer Trans Issue and it was hilarious because like we all had to like rank our like submissions or whatever and then all of us like we were all so divided except like you know what? we were all like yep yep she's like our favorite submission <laughs> like um a girlhood summer passes which is in Bint um definitely definitely uh check it out and um so I'm I'm just excited to read um, with everyone. I didn't initially do this. Um, I didn't initially plan on doing this, but I want to, I guess, kick it off with a poem about uh, wanting to push my now former PhD advisor out of a window. <clears throat> Defenestration fantasy, collapsing Sistina. Every window is a writer of fiction, Zaina al Sus. Trap your enemies in the poem, Marwa Hillel. Today, you will wake in the belly of a beast. Tomorrow, your beloveds will push you out of a window, presuming you survive the gnash and snarl, the roaring consequence. At the center of all that kills you is a hunger tenfolded into a gargantuan winter. Let me stop there. 
Metaphor won't be an enemy languaged against me, languaged against next day, memory will memoriam. Fathered against certainty, you will push those whom call you issue through a window and let them bird into lingering and inevitable metaphors and the ruptured, they will sing and sing forth the way a window knows no shock but shatter. What you mistake for hunger sleepless will be a half century's waning, bloodthirsting roar, and I know it from my own sleepless, from my father's roaring night snarl. How it embeds and plants a rock-torn window in my throat is how I know it as an ancestral hunger. At the end of your, and my, and, all my my's suffering is a window into a suffering I cannot witness. Something about the eyes as windows stains the memory complicit, not mine. And what is metaphor but a mirror mistaken for a window? I will not pretty this. I will the glass roaring with your name, unknowing as a bird to a windowless flight, midriff and careening. I will the, I will the fall, windless and swift, the crash and splat, the ground, a window thirsting for light, rarefacted into shimmer, rarefacted into hunger, swell and there. When the ground swallows you with windowed teeth, you will begin again from beast to rupture, to song, to window, when I will not say your name. And I will not say your name is a window into every poem or father's song unwanted, which roared out of me, despite I will your collapse, hypothesis, anti-window, and the space between that I am neither I nor I, but the window itself were I to bear in witness your widowed and inevitable. I would become the mirror, the win, the spoils and conquest of, and I will not run as dough into wind, though I will it unfurling. I will it for every self winding, every insomniac unreflection, the not me I witness in every window. This is my spell and I will it into every mirror, mirror in the window, window hunger against metaphors roaring window against hungers roaring metaphor in shatter it's toothless and naming wake thank you all um Yeah, so I guess I'm gonna. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't anticipate. I didn't initially want to do that poem. I'm TLDR. Like uh, I'm. I'm leaving Harvard. Uh, fuck Harvard. Um, fuck everyone here at this institution. Um, I don't have time for them anymore. Um, and I spent the last like three years essentially being like nonstop abused by my PI. And uh, so that's a poem for him. <laughs> uh, anywho. Um, I'm gonna change up the vibe a little bit. Um, and this will be the last poem I read and thank you everyone for uh, for having me. Feigen was book, ah! <laughs> Letter to be reflected and thrown into the shores of Tel Aviv. I'm writing to you from a land where I'm already myth but I suppose you knew that already. You've seen it before, but not through my eyes. With nothing but the wind tethering you here from some other goneness you could imagine. Let me be clear. To other men, this could be the right side of paradise. A foaming line waiting to swallow me back. Or where I'm from is no longer where I came from, but instead a blood's reckoning. Instead a hunger I cannot afford oceanic. Only a queer thing can swallow that much of me and still remain a whole and single body. Desire is desire. And here I am, pooled and thirsting. I promise there's a distance when I call this my capital and they call it theirs. But there's also a distance when I call this city mine and you, yours. It is a different kind of distance. Here our men don't have faces. Here I've taken that blood-stained flag down and yet Palestinian is the only identity I've ever been certain about. 
I promise. There are men who want me, but cannot stomach the idea of me existing, even if we cannot imagine them. Forgive me. I had such little faith in your imagination, but I'm beginning to think of faith as a fogged mirror into which we look and witness ourselves outside of ourselves and much like faith, we don't pray through mirrors. We understand through them. I want you to see me in this and every light. I'm not asking you to imagine me dead in a man's arms, but I am asking you to see me as always becoming both I and death of. It's true. At the center of every myth, is a loneliness larger than the whole of us, but is it not polyamory if I love myself into a multitude? I'd like to think there is somewhere a you I can return to. I'm trying to say I love you, but I don't have the right mythos for it. I'm trying to say I love him, but he already isn't. I don't wanna call this a coming out. That would imply there was ever a border to reckon. If I let this become an elegy, that means I failed. War is war and war alone. I won't speculate on all the exiles I could inherit at your hands. I want to say I already forgive you for what is to come, that the opening wound of me forgives the ocean its salt, but this too is contingent upon the promise of violence. Forgive me. I can't fathom the concept of returning to you. I want to add to every person, every country that once mothered me, but maybe I needed this to be instead a mirror. This is what I know. I fell in love with Summer like he wasn't a bad decision. We kissed with all our teeth. He bit me and the blood surfaced, but did not pull. We pulled rivers from each other until we forgot we were human. We slow danced in an empty field as the world ended around us. I'm always at the edge of violence. It is how I constructed mercy, forgiveness, a sadness I cannot afford. I only know my lovers as seasons that pass through me. Therefore, I am either land or ocean, but never the border between I too want to be interrupted by daybreak. I too have stained and been stained beneath the same moonlight. I'm not saying I love him. I just know I'm worthy of a good fight. I promise there are prettier ways to lie to ourselves, among ourselves. You ask me what the weather's like in my city every time. This is how you've come to understand the distance between us. And what is an obad but a lie we tell to convince ourselves morning's coming bloodless. I loved him, phantasm. Forgive me. I loved him, anthemless and splendored. Forgive us. I lied. What I'm looking for is the opposite of forgiveness. Thank you all so much. George, that was absolute chills. Uh, as someone rightly mentioned the Abed line, I am still, I, I am a little shook. Uh, that was incredible. Thank you so much for such an incredible performance. I apologize for my cat. Uh, and, but this was, it was absolutely incredible, George. You know how much of a fan of you I am and you always bring me to tears and thank you for moving us with words in such a kind and orderly fashion. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our next reader for today. It is Aria Aber, who was also kindly our judge for the debut Own Voices Prize. I'm gonna share their bio quickly in the chat. Um, here we go. Arya Eber was raised in Germany where she was born to Afghan refugees. She's the author of Our Damage, University of Nebraska Press 2019, which won the Prairie Schooner Book Prize and a Whiting Award. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New Republic, Poetry and Elsewhere. 
She is currently a Stegner Fellow in Poetry at Stanford University. As George said, Hard Damage is the best book from 2019. It was my favorite book of 2019. It is my top 10 favorite poetry books of all time. Arya, take it away. The stage is yours. Thank you. Um, oh my God, I feel like so weird to follow these absolute legends. Um, I think I need to take a moment. <laughs> and just like breathe in and out. Um, wow, what a lineup. And uh, Genoa, congratulations on your publication day. I'm so excited for Bin to be out in the world. It was incredible to read it. I knew immediately that it had to be one of the winners. Um, it's just so concise. Every poem is like a little knife and the way they accumu accumulate in the form of the chapbook is just incredible. Like I'm in awe of, of your vision for that chapbook and I'm so excited for everything that's gonna follow for you. Um, thank you for inviting me to read here. It's an honor. Um, Persian New Year is tomorrow and I just went um, to a Palestinian grocery store and bought like things for my half scene and now I'm like reading with all of you and it feels so nice to be in community with like Middle Eastern and South Asian people right now while we're all alone and in quarantine. Um, okay, so I, I'll probably read um, two poems from Heart Damage and then I might read a new poem um, that's a little bit happier. Uh, I'll start with uh, reading Rilke in Berlin. Into English I splintered the way my father clutched his valise at the airport, defeated and un-American. It took me 12 strange springs to know nothing occurs out of a sudden. How do I let it go? Little has been purloined from me and the ghosts of childhood still sibilate, by which I mean nobody has touched me on my innermost parts. At the accent reduction class, my teacher instructed me to invert my tongue like in love. So I lay at a pavement, under your elegy, in a bridge. Such starkness, the want to put inside me a perfect sentence. What would have Lou Salome done? I absolved every year around the sun, knowing that there is an animal smell hooked to a line leading past a border I am not going to cross. But what is exile exactly? What exactitude? Father says hour for hour, allo for hello. Father says is good, don't come back, eat food, green card. If I could explain to him the difference between exist and exit, maybe others too will hear the law in allo. When they asked my mother, where are you from? She smiled and replied, Fine, how are you? Oh, I shoved my hand right through the officer's mouth and ripped out his tongue. Then under my pillow, I placed it and waited for it to bloom new my blood. Um, I also realized that I didn't describe my frame. Uh, I'm an Afghan woman with dark hair and uh, medium olive skin and I'm sitting on a wicker peacock chair and that's all you can see on my background so yeah i'm i also have to say that this is kind of the highlight of or one of the highlights of my week um in a very strange time in the us and generally in the world um with the shooting of the asian women in atlanta i feel I've been thinking a lot about asian american community and and what it means to be asian in this country and in the West in general. And I, I feel really helpless and kind of, yeah, powerless in the face of what we can do um, in order to prevent these things happening in the future, but also how do we stand in community against the state, which is sponsoring this type of violence. Um, I've been thinking about my own aunts and the women in my life 
who definitely think of themselves as Asian more than anything else. And um, Asia, of course, is not just East Asia, but it's important that we create the community across all the countries that that continent encompasses. And so I'm gonna read a poem about my aunts. Afghan funeral in Paris. The aunts here clink Malbec glasses and parade their grief with musky, expensive scents that whisper in elevators and hallways. Each natural passing articulates the unnatural. Every aunt has a son who fell or a daughter who hid in rubble for two years until that knock of officers holding a bin bag filled with a dress and bones. But what do I know? I get pedicures and eat madelines while reading Swan's Way. When I tell one aunt I'd like to go back, she screams, it is not yours to want. Have some cream cheese with that, says another. Oh, what wonder to be alive and see my father's footprints in his sister's garden. He's furiously scissoring the hyacinths, saying all the time when the tele-researcher asks him, how often do you think your life is a mistake? During the procession, the aunt's wails vibrate, wires full of crows and heavy wind. I hate every plumed minute of it. God invented everything out of nothing, but the nothing shines through, said Paul. Valérie. Paris never charmed me, but when some stranger asks if it stinks in Afghanistan, I am so shocked that I hug him and he lets me, his ankles briefly brushing against mine. Um, I had initially planned to read another poem, but um, I'm going to read one more poem and it's going to be my America poem. So. Thank you everyone again and Genoa, congratulations. America. America, the footsteps of your ghosts or white stones waiting my center. America, the old girls campus in the heart of Oakland where I teach, grows quiet as glass marbles rolling between my feet. I pick one up, I say, it's pretty. And my students laugh, cheering, welcome to America. I had no one to look to this summer. I light a candle, burn the proposedly holy wood, and God does not come when summoned. Just the scent of bonfire in my hair, gold light flooding the bay window, sure as a divination. America, I divine nothing. In the other country, my parents wear their silence like silk ropes each morning, doting the terrible sun. Day after day, I weep on the phone saying, even the classroom is a prison. And still my father insists, but it is good to become an American. And so I cement my semantics. I practice my pronunciations. I learn to say this country after saying I love. I rinse my aquiline face, wring my language for fear. I feared what had happened in your forest, the words that pursued the soft silk of spiders. The verbs were naturalize, charge, reside. The nouns were clematis, alien, hibiscus. America, I arrived to inhabit the realm of your language. I came to worry your words. What you offered is a vintage apartment, an audience for poems pills the color of dusk to swallow so as not to collapse when I read the poem about my uncle, the reading of which I owe him to everyone who antecedes me. No, I mean who haunts me, the haunting of which is a voice. The West is too young to be haunted, an ex-lover assures. Still, every night I listen to your voice scraping against my walls and in the mornings, trivial offerings on my pillows. I pick the spiders from my bed, flush their curl transparence down the drain. America, I don't know what to make of my ordinary cruelty or my newly bourgeois pain. 
venom lacing each crack of the historic apartment, venom lacing the porcelain plates we hand out at parties. In the hallway, I let someone touch me under my mask, three fingers in my mouth, my back pushed against the door, the cold sink, the mind play, plays where it leads a dark hour, the weight of a body on indigo tiles. America, the scale says, not thin enough. America, my lawyer suggests to keep quiet about certain things, about you and me. So I write in my notebook your name. I write country of cowboys and fame. America, I have no cowboy and I have no fame. All I gather is the scratching of ink against paper, the laugh of a skeptic. There are nights we hear something likened to fireworks lighting up the humid campus. And my students cheer, they laugh, welcome to America. Later in the empty corridor, the disembodied voice of my uncle saying, the classroom is not a prison, saying, go, go home now. And so I go past vetiver and cedar, past eucalyptus declaring the shoreline. Until I shiver on the soft stone post on which my father once lay, and I proclaim what he did, I say, this land is my fate. America, who am I becoming here with you? If I wander the same as without you, barely visible amid your indigenous trees. Thank you. I think a couple of things. Uh, Arya is still that poet. I guess we all know uh, she remains the most <sighs> incredible poet of this generation, that all of those pieces were so moving. Uh, and number two, I'm very struck by how beautiful the voices of each of the readers are today, uh, I think. It's just, it, it's something we experienced with Lela, it's something we experienced with George and now with Arya, it's just like good, like sensory therapy happening here, which I really appreciate. I love a good voice. Um, number three, I also wanna shout out to all the people drunk right now, because I know the poetry is hitting you differently. I know that, you know that. Okay, so let's not pretend otherwise. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our next poet uh, who will be joining us through a very special video. I'm going to read their bio really quickly. Hala Leon is a Palestinian American writer and clinical psychologist whose work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Guernica, and elsewhere. Her poetry collections have won the Arab American Book Award and the Crab Orchard series, and her debut novel won the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Her second novel, which is just out, I'm so excited. The Arsonist City will be published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt in March, 2021. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and give you the experience of Hala Alian in all their glory. Just give me one moment. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Can I get a thumbs up? Okay, perfect. Okay, just wanna make sure that Sorry, just want to make sure that I'm also sharing the audio. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Hala Alian, um, and I am so excited about this book launch and so excited for all of you that haven't already read Renwa's work to read it. Um, Renwa is, aside from just being on a personal level, one of the most amazing people I've ever met, um, somebody that has truly been such a such a support and an amazing, generous friend um, and a lifesaver, also just is an incredible poet, um, has a stunning command of language, and Vint is just honestly one of the best chapbooks I've ever read. So I'm very excited for you all to read it um, and very grateful that I was invited to share some poems today. So I'm gonna start with self-portrait as my mother. When the warplanes come, I pluck them from the blue sky like Tic Tacs. The cupboard is always full of honey and needles, Merlot and Marlboros, the rumor of America around my neck, it tightens. 
On the third day of the month, I bleed upon, toss a gun into its mouth. I am the gun. The chamber empties into a Feiruz song. Take the color of the trees with you. California is my safe word. Oh bird, oh bird, a wink of a car on a highway. I know a nation by its germs, its endangered water. I know the desert as an unborn son and every night I claim him. His black hair spiky as a cactus. Give me a fate and I'll lose it. Give me a border and I'll run it crooked as a love line on a bride's palm. I sing, I mop the floors, I can't kill for enough clean. At the brocante, I buy mirrors and clocks, lavender seeds, bird feeders fill my house with the belongings of dead men, my breasts rise. I read the drugstore horoscopes. My moon is in Sagittarius, suns in Akka, heavens an empty sky, borders open, there is nothing on the other side, and isn't that God enough? When they say pledge allegiance, I say, my country is a ghost, a mouth trying to say sorry, and it comes out all smoke, all citizen and bullet and seed. My country is a machine, a spell of bad weather, a feather lacing my mother's black hair. I mean her dyed hair. I mean her blonde hair. I mean her hair matches my country, so shiny and borrowed and painted over. My country is a number, like it is 1948 and my great-great-grandmother flattens bread with her hands while my other great-great-grandmother prays with her hands. One watches her land disappear and the other builds a house on land that will disappear. My country is an airport line, a year of highways and intermission. My country is Stockholm syndrome as immigrant mouth saying thank you, saying please, saying my country is no country but ghost, is no man but ghost. My country is dead. My country is named the dead, is give them their salt, give them their salt. My country is a mouth trying to say pledge and it comes out all salt. My country is a mouth and nobody can pronounce my name. I mean, my country forgets my name. I mean, my country is always asking for my name and I am always saying it twice, spelling it like an address. My country is a number, like it is 1967 and every Arab leader is crying. Every mother is clutching the son she has left and my great grandmother names my mother nostalgia while my great grandfather names my father a gun. My country is all ghost. My grandmother is all ghost. My grandmother is a country. I mean, my grandmother is my country. I mean, my country is a lie is an emptied house, is 1,000 cardboard boxes. My country is, remember when we left Akka? I mean Gaza, I mean Homs. My country is a number, like, it is 1990. My mother is crossing a border, I mean life, I mean desert, I am at her heels. I am paying attention. I mean, I am learning to pray to a flag. I mean, I am learning English. I mean, I am forgetting Arabic, or it is 1994 and I am falling in love with a white boy, a habit I will never kick. Or it is 2006 and my grandparents won't evacuate, won't leave another war and all summer I dream of floods, collect bullets and love the wrong person. Or it is 2003 and I am in Beirut watching Baghdad burn because of America. I mean, I am in my country watching my country burn because of my country. Or it is 2016 and who saw it coming? Some saw it coming. Or it is 2019 and the women in Beirut are a sea. I mean, my country looks beautiful in red. I mean, I look beautiful in red. I mean, this country likes me in red. Or it is every year and my country is taken. My country is stolen land. I mean, my country, I mean, all my countries are stolen land. I mean, sometimes I am on the wrong side of the stealing. My country is an opening. I mean, bloom. I mean, bloom not like flower, but bloom like explosion. My country is a teacher. I mean, do you want to see my passport? I mean, do you like my accent? I mean, I stole them. I mean, I stole them. I mean, where do you think I learned that from? Thank you so much again for inviting me. Um, and Renoir, I love you. I love your work. I'm so excited for more people to read your poetry. Thanks, everyone. That was the incomparable Halalian. Uh, I remember reading Salt Houses for the first time as, you know, just a few years ago in, in Mumbai and just feeling like everything I wanted to say in, in, in book form had been represented. And that is how I feel after that poem, that after that incredibly moving rendition. Um, 
I'm so excited she was able to be a part of this in some form or capacity. Uh, I am also equally excited uh, to introduce our poet of the hour, Ginwa Javhari. Uh, it is the pub day for Bint, a absolutely compelling, absolutely beautiful piece of work. I wanna give a little bit of background on how Bint came to be a collection that was published today. Um, I was uh, an early reader for uh, the, the submissions that had come in and we were collating uh, a, a, a selection for Arya to go through. And I remember reading uh, Bint and I remember rereading Bint, even though that was an absolute waste of my time because I had hundred more manuscripts to go through. I was just like, this is not what I should be doing right now, but I needed to reread Bint. You know, I needed to read it again. And I thought any collection that demands to be read again, that demands to be consumed, that demands to be devoured is a collection that deserves to be out in the world. Um, I remember the day that Arya sent us the email with the winning manuscripts, uh, the little hurrah that I did in, in that small corner uh, that I call heart uh, and how excited I was that Bent and there is still singing in the afterlife or the two collections that had made it uh, and that were the winning manuscripts. Uh, from an editorial standpoint, Ginwa has been an absolute delight to work with. Uh, she has been absolutely, you know, innocent and also forthcoming and also ambitious and also nervous and also excited and also you know, so open to all the conversations you can have about this collection and beyond. Uh, I know at Radix Media, we are so proud to be the people behind your debut outing in this world, that we are so excited we are able to launch this collection into the stratosphere, uh, as I mentioned, and I am so excited that we get to be here today and celebrate your work. This is not the first, this, this may be the first, but this won't be the last thing you will ever put out in the world. World. You, there will be so many collections of poetry uh, that are going to happen, and I am so excited to watch and cheer from the sidelines. Um, so before, before we begin, I'm going to quickly read Ginwa's bio, and then I have a few questions for Ginwa that I'm hoping that all of us are interested in, and then I guess Ginwa can do her reading. Just quickly, give me a moment, I'm going to share it in the chat. Here it is. Ginwa Jawhari is a Lebanese-American writer based in Brooklyn, New York. Her essays, fiction, and poetry appear or are forthcoming in Catapult, Narrative, Mizna, The Adroit Journal, and elsewhere. She is a 2021 Margins Fellow at the Asian American Writers Workshop. Bint is her debut collection. Find more of her work at ginwajawhari.com. So Ginwa, I just have one question for you. As someone who has also just worked, a concluded work temporarily on a collection of poetry that is shamelessly, unabashedly, you know, candidly dedicated to girlhood and womanhood, um, and just how compelling the narratives of women are in, in the cultures that we come from. The question that I have for you is this, what is it about the girlhood that is specific to your experience that would differentiate Bint from other collections that are feminist and that are honest in their explorations of womanhood? Wow. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a really good question, Meher. Um, I will say before answering it, I'm so excited that everyone is here and so excited that we had these like incredible readers who I'm obsessed with and in love with and I bought all of your books and I have them and I read them and it's amazing. Um, and I need to thank Radex Media also before I answer um, for, for being also a joy uh, to work with. Um, the balloons my sister did this morning, so somebody mentioned that and then we're very festive um, right now. Um, I guess to answer your question, I, I wrote Bint and I guess I titled it very much um, as a nod to the communities that know what Bint is. Um, somebody made the comment to me, actually a few people made the comment to me kind of early and asked, are you sure you want to call it that? Are you sure you want to put Arabic on it? I don't know, that seems off-putting. But um, I, I think we should stop writing towards the white gaze and towards the male gaze and um, embrace, I guess, uh, so much of where we come from, which is um, maybe traumatic and maybe 
maybe you know painful or or scary, but um, to write about, I guess, uh, specifically an Arab upbringing in the Midwest, which is where I am right now. I'm with my sister, um, so uh, so much of that is what went into Bint and kind of the loneliness of being isolated in the Midwest uh, around, you know, I guess white Caucasian um, people who were kind of uh, maybe. I don't know, scared of you or or disgusted by you. Um, and so you grow up feeling, I guess, really unloved, unnoticed, unrecognized. And when I wrote this, I just wanted it to be for those girls, for those bints, which is very more for the Benet, I guess. But the bints is kind of a nod to the Arab American pluralizing um, a traditionally Arabic word. So so that's, I guess, what, what my answer off the top of my head would be. Thank you so much. I'm so excited that as women of color, as, as writers from countries that are shifting and changing, we are in a position to be able to write to those women, write to those people and use poetry and language as a conduit to reach out, to extend a hand. I'm so glad that your collection is a part of this endeavor. Ginwa, I'm gonna let you take it away. I'm gonna let you read the poetry you're here to read. I'm excited for all of the audience here to experience Bint for the first time in your voice. Take it away. This is Ginwa Johari reading Bint. Thank you, Meher. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm nervous, I'm not gonna lie. I took some propranolol because I was <laughs> definitely shaking. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to read four. Um, it's a chapbook, it's not super long. And like Arya mentioned, they're kind of concise. Um, I'm, I'm gonna see how it goes, then maybe three, we'll see. Um, the first one I'm gonna read is called Tazahir. Tazahir in Arabic means pretend. Um, and uh, this is forthcoming, I think also in Adroit, if I'm not mistaken, this month. So this is Tazahir. What a doll I was those years after the towers fell. I went blonde as one goes insane, womaned with a new name, an easy oleo for the tongues that tisked me. Gone were the guttural consonants, the hairs connecting my brows. I starved my hips. I wore English like a ring until men begged my father for my hand. I detached my hand and gave it to him, a fishing lure. A prophet arrived to open the leaves of me, his cat tongue barbed for bone. We pilgrimaged after the fete as if we had land to return to. We spoke of the city as our parents knew it. Beirut's sixties, glistening bodies just destined for martyrdom, radio static, glass bottles of Pepsi. We only uttered words we knew, sang only songs we remembered. Every day I used the wrong type of rice. We decorated our home in tourist flags. A blue eye hung over our door, reflecting the eyes of the street. That's Tazahir. Thank you, guys. Um, this next one's uh, this next one's called Winter of the Acne Year. It's about kind of, I guess, the onset of puberty. Um, all of this is the onset of puberty. What isn't about the onset of puberty? That's a different discussion. <laughs> all right. Um, this is Winter of the Acne Year. Beneath the quilts piled on us, I silenced with my hands, the loud wet thing that would not let me sleep. Hawed myself to dog panting at the remembered eyes of the man who had slaughtered a ram before me. It flagged a dehydrated tongue, flat pupil parallel to the earth, hurled its horn head like a slingshot, then hoofed, kneeled. I watched the butcher disassemble the animal from the car. Over his head, Halal insisted in red coils, no wrongdoing. My mother, returning to the driver's seat, appetited for its glistening liver. The organ in white paper followed us home where she cubed it into meal. I recalled its size, its flab texture, the bleat. Its oil swarmed my mouth like a vow. That's winter of the acne hero. Thank you guys. Oh Lord. All right. I think we have time. Meher, right? Where is she? She disappeared. <laughs> we have time <laughs> for um for maybe two more. Um oh good. Okay. <laughs> okay, this poem is called Shahwa. Uh Shahwa in Arabic can mean um appetency or desire. So you can have Shahwa towards food, but you can also have Shahwa uh sexually, like towards um a person. 
So this is Shahwa. And I'm gonna have some water because I'm raspy. Not intentionally. <laughs> okay. Girl, call all this Shahwa again with your namesake mouth. I will release my grudge like a weakened fist. Say it's practice for your groom or dispel the boredom of our afternoons or drink until the protest sleeps. Crush the apple against your teeth. The froth hangs semi-lunar from your chin, tart and fleeting as the unready. Barefoot on the balcony, drop your pail to the vendor who cries the names of his harvest like the muezzin. Buy your grandmother burlaps of cystic turnips to pickle. They blush pink in the jars you twirl, knocking in aquatic gravity. Winter will arrive with its usual cravings, vinegar of the unseasonable held past its prime, salt thick, rubber as muscle. Your palate succumbs to pleasure, pleasure crusted pricks. Your tongue soars, unfolds in its red canopy bed. Eat until you are full. Then sob, salvage. Appetite is an eye that does not stop itching, inviting again your curled hand. Thanks, guys. All right, last one. Um, Meher and I discussed this poem at length because we were debating whether it should go in the beginning. And, and I, I thought it was a little bit too strong to go in the beginning, so I'm going to end with it. Um, this poem is called Birth During a Ceasefire, um, and it is very much about a birth during a ceasefire. Uh, yeah, she says, I love a strong poem. Yes, very much. All right, and this is the last, this is the last of what I'll read. Um, this is Birth During a Ceasefire. Beirut, a glow, blue neon of a prayer bead every two decades reborn. My grandmother sweats her out like a night of drinking. Around her, the city swarms with smoke and future martyrs. My mother arrives without a doctor, early witness to a blockade. Young platoons comb Beirut's capillary alleys, suck from ruined cigarettes along the cleft lip of the corniche. A country's worth of optimism trills their newfound baritones. In earnest, they shout, brother, Embrace, clap shoulders open palmed. My grandmother marries an anxious lieutenant, sleeps with his pharmacist addicted to solutions. Empty apartments infested with boy soldiers, mites, refugees, leap from one landlord to another. July, chaperones, an inward pilgrimage. How troublesome in patience. A drink left on the balco balcony rail to fall. A woman in heat pacing. Flat stones skipped and drowned, small bodies unrecoverable. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you guys, Thank you so much. I must mention there are calls of encore uh, as <laughs> often are after a great set. <laughs> Would you be so kind as to do another poem? Yeah, there's literally only like three poems in the book. So. <laughs> I'm I mean, yeah, that's the nature of a chat book. That's true, but I guess I'm. I'm guessing you could. You could. You, you I can, can. I can do one more. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, yeah, so go for it. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Do them all. <laughs> do them all. Okay. Um. Well, oh, I didn't plan for for more than those, but let me let me see. Let me see. One second. Hold a full on. night of bind. <laughs> Oh, I, oh, that's a good one to do. Okay, so, so I, I just got a request from my sense. So I'm gonna do the one about, um, that I wrote about Sarah Hagazi and, uh, and um, <laughs> on the day of her suicide, I wrote this. Sarah Hagazi was a queer Egyptian <laughs> activist um, and she, uh, she died by suicide in exile when she was in Canada. She was exiled because she went to a, um, yeah, Allah Yerhama, of course. She was exiled because she went to a um, Mashua Laila concert, which was a queer band that was playing, they're actually Lebanese. And um, I was reflecting a lot about the relationship between Lebanon and Egypt, which is ancient. Um, we've had a lot um, of back and forth between Egypt since before time. Um, and so I was thinking a lot about the microcosm of Egyptian film, which is a lot like Hollywood in the Middle East. Not much anymore, but back in the day. Um, and so I, I, I think it's fitting, I guess, that I can definitely read this one. Um, and, and it means a lot to me, this poem. 
So um, it's a line from her suicide note. It's called, I tried to find redemption. And um, if you guys aren't familiar with her suicide note, definitely look her up and, and read it all. It's, it's heartbreaking and we need to get her story out for sure. Okay, so this is, I try to find redemption. As if Cairo and all her alleys did not twist endlessly about the small bones of our ears, the classics flaunting their scripted beauty. My mother replayed every tape. Here the actresses in their black bobs and gold inferno rich each line. Their dialect lols, satiric and slinky. Baby fat belly dancers ribbon across the set. Actors respond to Effendi with a single brow. What glitz was pharaohless Egypt but dunes and dunes of glittering starlets against backdrop men, frames emptying to black whenever their opposite bodies arched as rehearsed. As if we did not imagine another Cairo in bed, film scenes still carmine beneath our lids. Consider the ends, a hero dies or marries. Actresses, their peeling laughs, breaking laws in every language, opened windows in our dreams both-handed, waved us in, naked elbows on the sill. Music spilled into the street, instruments harmonized as composed. Hair raising, still, our tendency to disagree. What response could we conjure that wasn't always no? Exile awaited the proudest. Shame reaped in the silent. Still, we slept in our parents' house. Still, upon waking, we forgave. Thanks, guys. <laughs> that was Bint by Ginma Johari. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this very special virtual launch. If you loved that work, as I'm sure you have, please purchase a copy of this of this lovely chapbook. I, I think of it as a collectible item. Uh, if you loved it, please talk about it on your social media. Please uh, populate your WhatsApp, Telegram, Instagram, Signal groups with this store link and have people purchase a copy of the book. Um, as Arya mentioned, one of the beautiful things about today is that after a week of so much violence, we are able to be in community with one another, that we are able to be in solidarity, that we are able to be uh, to, to talk about our culture, our languages, our lives uh, without the intrusion of, of, of voices that, seem to, that seek to harm and marginalize us. I want to put a call out uh, for organizations. If you feel like you'd like to donate to organizations that are actually Active in their efforts to combat anti-Asian violence, please donate uh, to the links in the links that I'm uh, providing below. There is uh, the Asian American Pacific Highlander um, uh, Community Fund, and we have the Asian Americans Advancing for Justice in Atlanta. I am sharing the links for that in the chat. If you are able, please uh, please uh, forward a donation to each of these organizations. Um, I want to thank everybody who joined today. I think I have been holding a cry for the last week, and I think I speak for everyone that tonight's the night. I think it is going to get released after this event. If uh, you would like a copy, but you are not currently based in the US, please email me at meher at radixmedia.org. We want to make sure we get a copy to everybody and uh, we will find a way to talk to you and we will find a way to figure a, um, a um, what's the word? Shipping rate? I guess that's the word. Shipping rate. We will figure a shipping rate out. Uh, if you are a writer of color who has a submission that you would like Radix Media to consider, that is also the email you share it to. If you are a writer uh, who has inputs about today's reading or about our works or who has any feedback, you can also email to that link. This was uh, the second winning manuscript of the Own Voices Prize. As I mentioned, we are opening up submissions again in a month or two. So please keep an eye out. Uh, I can give you a hint. It is not for chapbook and it is not for poetry. So if you are someone who writes sentences and lots of it, then this year's Own Voices Prize would be for you. So please stay in touch. I'm gonna again pass the mic to Ginwa and anybody in the room who'd like to unmute and say a few words. This is the time for some celebration. This is the time for thanking one another. I want to also one last note, thank Lela, George, Aria, and Hala for being a part of this event, for sharing their beautiful poetry, their wonderful voice, both literal and 
literary uh, and uh, for being a part of our community. We're Radix Media. We're very grateful for the presence of all of you. And I'm going to play Beirut thematically, Beirut by Yasmin Hamdan as we talk and we say thanks and we say goodbye. Thank you guys all for coming. Thank you for everybody who came and especially our demigods of readers that we had, George and Laila and Arya, of course, and Hala. Arya, I submitted, I think I told you because you were the judge. So literally this happened because of you and because of hard damage, which I carried around in my purse and would just pull out all the time. Um, and it's, I'm so happy that you guys were able to read um, with us because you guys are amazing. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. Thank <laughs> you.